thanks so much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to join you and this wonderful Congress for the meeting today. Um, I am just gonna start. I don't know. I have the pleasure of talking about meningiomas from a neuropathological molecular perspective. Um, I think this audience knows no introduction to meningiomas as a whole, in which they come in all varieties, flavors, sizes, locations, and most importantly, behaviors. That spectrum of behaviors over the ages since the initial description by Harvey Cushing till the most recent iteration has in general been described by a constellation of histopathologic features. The most recent um, published version of the World Health Organization grading scheme classifies meningiomas into three grades with nine histologic subclasses of grade one, three for grade two, and three for grade three. And in essence, these are divided between the number of mitoses expressed by uh, the tumor, a number of histopathologic features, as well as their characteristic appearance <laughs> in the microscope. <laughs> The, um, however, these do not capture a tumor like this, which is a patient that we took care of for many years and even at her sixth and final surgery before her demise, she was still deemed a grade one meningioma. I think anyone who was to meet this patient or to see these pictures would consider this a malignant meningioma. Conversely, there are many tumors that we encounter like this that are described as a grade two meningioma, but yet after surgery with no adjuvant radiation has durable control for a number of years. So how do we distinguish the sheep in the wolf's skin versus the wolf in the sheep's skin in the words of Dr. al -Mefti? Or most importantly, how do we accurately identify meningiomas by behavior? Um, this has been addressed by a number of groups over the years, including with a, few, uh, with a few molecular features that have been viewed as being quite important, the most important of which includes CDKN2A and CDKN2B loss, as well as the TERP promoter mutation, which is observed to associate with poor behavior in many cancers. On the basis of these studies, the newest version of the World Health Organization grading scheme for meningiomas in 2021 and beyond now officially includes for the first time in almost 100 years, the inclusion of molecular features in defining meningiomas in their grading. Specifically, that a clear cell meningioma, for, which is a type of grade two meningioma, is defined by SMARC-E1 loss, which can be discerned on just immunohistochemistry Likewise, um, grade three meningioma is automatically conferred on a tumor if it has CDKN2A to B deletion and TERP promoter mutation. This impacts us in the clinical workflow because we are now, um, the onus is on us to devise ways to incorporate this such molecular testing into the routine uh, classification of meningiomas. However, um, those events, CDKN2A2B loss, as well as TER promoter mutation, are extremely rare across meningiomas. So while powerful, they don't affect the, the large um, population of tumors that we see on a daily basis. Several groups have attempted to address this by looking at genome-wide signatures. One example is the beautiful work done by the Heidelberg group in which they looked at methylation signatures. So in this top right corner, you can see a Breyer prediction curve in which the lower the curve, the more accurate uh, the prediction of reality, specifically recurrence. And so here the comparison is between the WHO uh, classification system, which is in red, versus methylation classification systems in blue and green. And in essence, application of genome-wide um, classification to meningiomas improves the prediction of outcome. While that is uh, wonderful and you know better allows us to, to address patients in terms of prediction of how they will do. The challenge with many of these proposed classifiers is that they're fairly high-tech platforms that are not universally accessible, and they uh, rely on black box algorithms that, that require um, proprietary knowledge to do. So how do we overcome this? Because ultimately the most useful and the most important uh, classification system has to be aligned in being accessible by the world at large, um, wherever the clinician and the patient is. 
So we looked at this with our prospective experience at the Brigham and Women's in Dana-Farber over the last 10 years to think about how we can take high technology to transform it to a more accessible basis and to ultimately create something that was simple, accurate, scalable, transparent, and most importantly, accessible so that it can be useful. We did this because of the wonderful um, resources endowed by our pathology and neuro-oncology divisions to allow every meningioma resected at the Brigham and Women's Hospital over the past decade to be molecularly profiled for their copy number. And so that prospective experience of now over 1,200 cases allows us to uh, look at something like this. So this is a complex figure of a heat map in which every single vertical tick mark is an individual patient, and each row is a chromosome, chromosome 1P down to 22 with CDK N2A and 2B at the very bottom. The presence of a color indicates the alteration, the loss or the gain of a chromosome arm in blue and red respectively. Neutral background is a normal genome. So what you can notice in the WHO grade one meningiomas, which are to the left compared to the WHO grade two versus grade three meningiomas, respectively on the right, that a majority of the grade one meningiomas have a neutral background. You can ignore the stripe of reds right now. Those are a specific subtype of meningiomas, the angiomatous meningiomas that have a distinct signature. Um, but you can see that there's about almost 20% of so-called grade one meningiomas that have a number of blues and reds, or in other words, they are just as messed up as the grade two and grade three meningiomas to the right. Conversely, there's a population of the grade two atypical meningiomas that have a neutral or a normal genome in this um, pale yellow stripe right here. So we formally looked at this because it has been long recognized that chromosomal abnormalities are a signature of higher grade meningiomas as opposed to unique mutations that are more frequently observed in grade one or benign meningiomas. And so we looked at every possible um, clinical, molecular, and histopathologic feature available to us and put it into univariate analysis to come up with a shorter list that was associated for recurrence after controlling for for a surgical resection, and these are all primary tumors that did not have prior adjuvant radi prior radiation, or they, they are not radiation-induced meningiomas. Um, upon doing that, we came up with a shorter list of what we considered high-risk molecular alterations. We preserved the wisdom of the ages from the WHO by keeping mitosis, mitotic count, as being a feature in this integrated grade, and we took away histology, which is the most variable from observer to observer across pathologies, across centers, and across selection of tissue within the tumor, and came up with a new molecularly integrated grade, um, which is one, two, and three, based on these simple features. First, how does this uh, perform compared to the traditional WHO grade? Well, both in comparison to both the existing 2016 WHO grade, as well as the upcoming uh, 2021 or 2022 WHO grade, we see a significant crisscross of tumors. From the left is the traditional histopathologic grading system. The right is our molecularly integrated grading system. And you can see in particular that overall about a third of tumors will change to a higher or a lower grading scheme. Uh, but in particular, the atypical meningiomas, which are the most variable in their outcome, about a third of them are graded as a lower integrated grade and a third of them become a higher integrated grade, distilling these atypical grab bag of um, meningiomas into a more concrete categories. When we looked at tumors head to head comparison, it was even more striking. The so-called malignant meningiomas that are WHO grade two and three, the molecularly benign, an integrated grade one, show in the blue line here, almost did not recur over a long period of observation compared to the so-called benign meningiomas, WHO grade one, that were molecularly aggressive, integrated grade two and three in the red. So on this Kaplan-Meier curve for recurrence, you can see the dramatic distinction between a, uh, and the impact um, of integrated grade compared to the histopathologic grade in these discrepant cases. 
Moreover, when we looked at brain invasion, which has been in and out of the WHO grading scheme over the past century, um, what we noticed is that those, again, integrated grade, molecularly benign, molecularly favorable uh, tumors with brain invasion, which automatically would classify these tumors as being at least a grade two in the current scheme, did a lot better compared to uh, the integrated grade two and three tumors that were noted to be brain invasive, shown in red. So again, another striking difference for, for a feature that has been uh, somewhat confusing and controversial across the decades. When we looked at this across statistical models over time, what we uh, noticed is that the longer the observation period, the better molecular prediction got. So show in blue is the integrated grade, and show in red is the WHO over two robust uh, statistical models, uh, time-dependent AUC and time-dependent average pre precision. And the longer the observation period passed, the better uh, the integrated grade performed compared to the WHO grade. So it's particularly reassuring in a tumor like meningioma, whose outcome frequently requires years of observation to declare itself as the recurrence is in the setting of an excellent resection or excellent treatment, the recurrence is frequently slow and not rapid. Moreover, as I mentioned, the motivation for this study is that we can take the knowledge of something with a transparent model but apply it universally. And we took quite some pains to show that this copy number can be derived from a number. It's a common denominator from many, many molecular platforms. You can derive it from methylation, from expression, from genetic mutation sequencing, from basically any available uh, molecular profile can derive copy number. However, even if none of those platforms are available, one can still do fish for focal features. And what you can see here, when we tested the hypothesis, for example, for something that most uh, pathology labs would have, which is the ability to assess 1P19Q, since it's so common in um, the classification and necessary in the classification of gliomas, specifically oligodendrogliomas, even the addition of single two, three, or four features with every additional feature included, the um, prediction of meningioma outcome got better and better compared to the WHO. So that even if one does not have access to a genome-wide um, profile, one could choose common high-risk incidents and, for, for example, do fish or other assays for this. So what is the implication of that in treatment? Well, first and foremost, in the receipt or the determination of adjuvant treatment, of adjuvant radiation specifically. So for us, because of this data over the last decade, if a patient, especially a young patient, has a grade two atypical meningioma with relatively reassuring molecular feature, we do not um, recommend or give adjuvant radiation. Conversely, an older patient with a grade one meningioma, but with multiple chromosomal alterations that we think are high risk, we would recommend and advocate for adjuvant radiation. This also has implications for clinical trial design as well as recruitment, as unfortunately one of the shared features across most meningioma clinical trials to date is that they have not been universally successful. And perhaps one reason is that we are including high-risk patients as um, who patients who are perceived as being high grade or high risk were actually benign, and conversely, patients who are higher risk are being excluded, and that could wash out the signal in a patient population with that's relatively sparse, like meningiomas. So how else can we use this in daily life? Well, I'll take the example of radiation-induced meningiomas. This has been recognized to be more aggressive, you know, in general across the literature for many years, but controversy still resides on exactly how aggressive these tumors are. Uh, and one of those things that when we take a look at that is the fact that it's frequently cited that there are a number of so-called benign or grade one meningiomas. And so the initial receipt of radiation is sometimes cited as being equivalent to the initial molecular alteration, like a loss of NF2, and not necessarily additively more aggressive. We looked at this using our new molecular grade, and we observed that amongst the WHO grade one meningiomas, which are on the left in this pale blue stripe here, over two thirds of them were molecularly higher grade, shown in this yellow box here. 
And even among those that are integrated grade one and WHO grade one, a good number, greater than 50% of those have at least chromosome 1P loss, which is for us the equivalent of an atypical feature of a slightly higher risk, but not quite as high as the accumulation of other features. So this put together would argue that even if one does not routinely profile meningiomas in general, that to consider at least profiling the radiation-induced meningiomas as those can significantly differ between their molecular features and their um, actual histopathologic feature. And shown here, this uh, demonstrates that radiation-induced meningiomas compared to our sporadic meningiomas, a far greater number, especially among the grade ones, will stratify to a higher molecular grade. So what does that mean ultimately for um, diagnosis and management? Um, so the uh, one thing that I, I will point out is despite the power of biology, um, surgery remains one of the single most important thing that we as neurosurgeons can do to delay recurrence and potentially to offer cure. So here I show the difference between the benign integrated grade one meningiomas and a more intermediate integrated grade two meningiomas. And you can see that even um, after controlling for the molecular biology of the tumor, that especially amongst the benign tumors, those that have a better resection still did far better than those with a lesser resection over time. So biology does not replace the adequacy of treatment and especially surgery. Furthermore, when we encounter patients on initial consultation, you know, what is the likelihood that their tumor is aggressive or not? And we looked at a constellation of our um, clinical series and, and classified them by their anatomic origin, as we are quite familiar with. And what you can see is that um, as previously you know, suggested in various papers, the anterior midline skull-based tumors, olfactory groove, planum, tuberculum, clinoid, are by and large benign, shown in red here. Um, that, especially when you look at their molecular profile, even more so than their histopathologic profile. Conversely, the falcine parasagittal and the intraventricular tumors are far more likely to be grade two or grade three, either by molecular features or by WHO features, allowing us to assess the risk of progression and perhaps the need for timing of intervention based on the anatomic location of these tumors. Um, I will point out that the literature has an assortment of studies which say that uh, skull-based meningiomas are more or less benign or aggressive than convexate meningiomas. But many of those tumors, uh, many of those papers cluster falcine parasagittal meningiomas with convexity meningiomas. And I would like to change the thinking, instead of thinking about skull-based or non-skull-based, rather to think of meningiomas, at least biologically, by three categories. That of the midline anterior skull base, which are by and large benign, uh, as seen in green here, that of the falcine parasagittal meningiomas, which are far more likely to be aggressive, and everything else. Everything in the petrous sphenoid origin with the rest of the convexity are not statistically different in their likelihood to be either more or less aggressive. But those two unique subsets of midline anterior skull base and falcine parasagittal are. So rather than thinking about skull base and non-skull base, to think of it as three classes, the falcine midline um, parasagittal sagittal kind of midline convexity, the midline anterior skull base, and everything else. So with all this, one might think that if we um, found a tumor in a 35-year-old that was WHO grade one, but had three high-risk features and molecularly grade two, we would recommend a radiation. But that is actually not what we do and not what we propose. So I'll give this example of a grade two meningioma patient who at age 45 underwent an excellent resection of a right frontal meningioma. And a few years later, uh, had this very small occurrence near the midline. She underwent radiation and had another recurrence two years after that. At this point, she's barely into her early 50s and, in, you know, and we would anticipate has 30 more years of life to live. So what do we do? Do we consider observation, reoperation, or irradiation? 
Well, the consideration in the, the issue of recurrent meningioma is why recurrence? Is it due to that of inadequate prior treatment, whether it's surgery or otherwise, or is it growth of residual um, that's microscopic and biologically more aggressive? And so depending on this, we looked at a series of about 1,000 MRIs in 40 patients with multiply recurrent meningiomas. And we, in essence, observed the same pattern throughout, which is one a tumor is truly aggressive, regardless of the type of intervention, whether it's surgery or radiation, there is a durability to the timing of control. And so what does that mean? That means that if we think a tumor is in a young patient in particular, might be more aggressive, whether it's because of how they've grown, their, their pattern of growth over serial MRIs, or the molecular profile, or the WHO grade, we might actually tend to favor observation as a powerful tool to stretch out the natural history because ultimately we're not treating the MRI, we're treating the patient and trying to maximize the durability of disease control for as long as possible to their natural lifespan. So with that, thank you very much for um, your attention.